So we're here to talk about US dollar covered bonds, um, which have been remarkably absent this year. Uh, I think we've had one deal from uh, Nord LB, Red a Reg S uh, 650 million transaction, and that was, that was it. Um, so we're here to discuss uh, <coughs> the outlook for dollar covered bonds. Uh, and uh, I'd like to get my panelists to briefly introduce themselves, starting on my right. Yeah, thank you. My name is Alex Anderson. I work at TD Securities as the head of the fixed income syndicate desk in New York. I'm Bill Thornhill, editor of uh, Global Capital. Uh, Bob Bahal, uh, co-head of the structured product group for Vanguard, and we manage um, assets for uh, structured products, including ABS, CMBS, and we actually include covered bonds as part of that, that AUM. Uh, I'm Anthony Tobin. Uh, I work at RBC Capital Markets in London, uh, similar to Alex. Uh, I run our uh, European syndicate desk there. So I'm going to kick off by uh, asking you guys a question. Um, hopefully some of you have downloaded the app and have an opportunity to vote. Um, and the first question that we have is what needs to change to improve dollar issuance? Uh, you'll see hopefully three choices coming up remove quantitative easing in Europe, which is, seems to be al already underway, uh, widening senior unsecured spread, uh, therefore making dollar funding a little bit more attractive, or a combination of the, uh, of the above. Um, so maybe I could start with Anthony. What's, in your opinion, why haven't, we, why haven't we seen any dollar issuance this year? What's holding the Canadians back? Has it got something to do with this senior preferred, non-preferred law? I don't think there's a sense that um, the uh, uh, bail-in legislation and the TLAC uh, reforms in Canada are really having much um, uh, uh, adjustment to the standard Canadian issuance patterns. What I think it's uh, demonstrative of is that uh, other markets have just been more competitive and when we remain in an environment where uh, net interest margin and uh, funding costs remain in focus, if you can save basis points elsewhere, then I think that um, you know, those alternative markets, be that Euros, Sterling, Aussie, Swissy, um, you know, uh, are generally providing sufficient capacity to meet the requirements that, that, that the Canadian banks and, and most other uh, regions uh, have. Um, you know, there's no, I don't think there's anything um, uh, uh, particularly uh, to say that, that covered transactions couldn't work within the US market. I think they could. But I think the pricing uh, point for them at the moment feels as though uh, it's not been something that the majority of issuers have felt compelling. I think that as we have seen, particularly uh, Euro and, and arguably other markets um, uh, become a little more challenged over the course of the past couple of months, it does feel as though dollars are coming more into the, uh, the playing field or the field of vision for uh, many issuers around, uh, uh, around the globe. And I think that you know, there's an expectation that we could see uh, some, uh, some future issuance. I've probably been saying that for quite a while. <laughs> um, uh, nevertheless, I think that um, you know, it does feel as though it's, it's more likely to occur over the course of the coming months than, than has been the case for, for quite, a few, uh, quite a few months before. Alex, what about senior unsecured? I mean, the market's been incredibly cheap. Uh, that preferred senior unsecured stuff is, is going to be pretty much uh, done and dusted. Scarce uh, supply of that going forward. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the Canadian issuers have, have made use of that, um, made hay while mm -hmm. the summer has been there. And I guess my, my point is how much do spreads need to, uh, to widen relative to senior or how much tighter mm -hmm. do cover bonds need to go relative to senior before cover bonds start looking interesting again for Canadian issuers? From the issuer perspective, and, and I agree with what Anthony said, there's, there's a number of factors that I think have limited the US dollar covered bond issuance in the last 12 to 18 months or so. One of the big ones from an issuer motivation perspective is the pricing benefit of encumbering your collateral in issuing a covered bond in US dollars relative to senior. That's where I sit and I spend most of my time. But to Anthony's point, they also look at sterling, euros, Aussie, Swissy, other currencies. So the US dollar covered bond market hasn't been super competitive from an issuer perspective for the last 12 months or so. And that's just a function of how good the senior unsecured market has been largely, to, to your point. So I think it's been the right approach from an issuer perspective that in a bull market, issue your highest beta product. Okay, we're not seeing a lot of subordinated issuance, but you may as well issue senior uh, and then wait for a period of volatility to make use of your collateral and issue your safest instrument. Uh, we've had a period of volatility for the beginning of this year. Seems like things have stabilized. 
but it has absolutely put covered bonds back on the radar of issuers. Um, you ask the question, how much does senior need to widen? There's not necessarily an exact number that I think borrowers or investors will probably get to that point soon, what, what they look for, but it does need to have some value of encumbering collateral, and in addition, it needs to provide some greater execution certainty relative to senior. Uh, we've probably had a period of many years where there was no doubt over the execution certainty of a senior transaction. So there was no need to do coverage. It's very helpful, but there's no need for it. I think in the last month or two, you've probably seen a little bit of a decrease in execution certainty on senior. Covered is untested. I'm very bullish and very constructive that it would be there should somebody need to come to that market. Can we get an investor perspective on the on the relationship? How do you see covered bond valuations? Uh, what do you look at? I mean, your background is more ABS, but you invest heavily in covered bonds as well. So, uh, what's your what's your valuation sort of uh, prism? How do you see covered bonds? It, it's it's a bit of a catch twenty two in some ways, right? Because the only time issuers come to the covered bond market, from what you just said, is when risk premiums are up, and they seek better execution for a safe asset class at a time when other asset classes that we would look at that are considered high quality secured are performing in a more volatile regime, right? And so that's the rub, right? Is um, it's, it's well understood um, in our framework that you know, the, the, the reason to use coverage is when there's an inefficiency between the secured and unsecured relationship, but that does create a dilemma for investors because then that we look across for us, right? We look across all the spectrum of opportunity that we have. Uh, the reason we framed it the way we have in our in our um, infrastructure is that um, uh, my group and the assets that we sort of invest in, right, which includes um, U.S. Uh, denominated assets, U.K. denominated assets, Australian denominated assets, all have secured nature to them. We can then make the trade-off on whether we're getting paid enough for that secured interest. So. You know, when you when you actually put it into that framework, you um, you may or may not think that it's a good value proposition, right? And I think that's part of we've heard in a few panels yesterday and over the years about um, how covered bonds don't have a home, and that's because they are they are a hybrid in many ways. Um, and so when you don't have regular issuance and you're trying to seek investors at a time that's beneficial in for for only one party, right? It does create inefficiency, right? And so. Um, it's, it's, it's uh, a mechanism that has to sort of self-regulate in that way, right? Like, so covered bond spreads to unsecured spreads, if they trade at their close to one, that's a good trade for investors, right? When they trade at 50, which is where, you, you know, issuers would like to see it in order to, to execute the trade, then investors may say, that doesn't seem a real compelling value, right? Unless other secured assets are also trading in that same context. And I think that's what's happening in the U.S. dollar covered bond market to some extent, right? And, um, we, we probably need to think through whether that's important to issuers to actually create either regular flow or understand those relative relationships to make covered bonds compelling for investors. Anthony, what's your perspective on the actual spread level that issuers look at in terms of senior versus covered? Where, where has it been? Now, I mean, I heard that three-year dollar senior was at one point actually trading inside covered uh, late last year, I don't know if that's true. But where does it need to get to, say, on the five-year point of the curve, where issuers, are they looking at it as a percentage? Are they looking at it as um, you know, a basis point differential? Where's that kind of target range where it starts to look interesting? And how far are we from that now? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that different issuers take a different perspective around it. Um, I think the two most common routes will either be those who think about an absolute basis point saving, and that goes back to my kind of net interest margin um, uh, comment uh, earlier. The range around that has probably been between 10 and 25 basis points um, uh, over the course of the past few years. Um, you know, uh, if it's less than 10, you know, not many folks see the, the logic, to your point, Alex, around encumbering uh, other assets. Others will take a percentage approach and say, if it's 75% of my senior unsecure spreads or there thereabouts, uh, that's the sort of trigger that, that I would see uh, as being an efficient use of the collateral and, and all the other associated elements of, uh, of moving into that issuance um, uh, will take. Um, which I feels as though we're, uh, we're sort of there or thereabouts at the current time in terms of the... Uh, what, the like 25 basis points differential almost there? It's, 
it's maybe sort of 20 basis points, something like that okay. um, uh, at the current time, which is, is meaningful uh, as a, a saving given that spreads are relatively uh, tight. Um, uh, but what I do think is that the other uh, element to it is not only thinking about um, uh, the uh, spread and the price, but also thinking about the capacity. Is it unlocking additional capacity that you can't necessarily find in the senior unsecured market? Is it targeting an alternative investor base, um, which may still be overlapping a little bit uh, with, uh, with other issuance, uh, uh, other investor bases that one, one uses? If you look, for, an ex for example, um, at the uh, Reg S dollar covered market, the, the European and Asian only market, that actually functions pretty well. Um, and I think that that has served, if anything, to almost have operated so well that other issuers perhaps think, why do I bother with the uh, uh, friction costs, hassle, legal bills of going down the onshore US route if I can still get access to you know, one of the same US dollar bills effectively in, uh, in Europe or Asia relative to, uh, to, to North America. And I think that becomes a trade-off for uh, issuers to think about, well, am I getting an incremental, um, uh, my whole uh, distribution may not all be new folks. I may have some old friends and some old faces that I recognize well within my, uh, my order book for this product. But am I reaching an incremental 20, 30, 40% of investors that I wouldn't otherwise touch? or portfolios within those investors that I otherwise wouldn't have the access to purchase to. So I think that, that, that combination of not just price, but also thinking about um, Diversification. strategic distribution mm -hmm. is, uh, is also important. Yeah, I was hoping we we're going to have two syndicate people versus one investor, but it sounds like Europe versus the US today because... <laughs> <laughs> Still I, uh, feels like two syndicate people versus <laughs> one investor. Right? Absolutely. The Reg S market is a viable funding route. Uh, I, I think it, to go down the 144A route for borrowers is not easy. There needs to be some compelling argument to convince them to do so. And that might be the ability to distribute on, on day one into portfolios, Bob, that, that you manage, uh, that you wouldn't be able to buy in a Reg S transaction. Uh, I think that the capacity is a, is a very important point. There's, there's not really an enormous reason for a borrower to do a US dollar covered bond if it's the same buyers as their senior unsecured deal. Uh, so there's a number of reasons why I think we unfortunately haven't seen an enormous amount of covered bond supply in dollars over the last 12 to 18 months. And perhaps it's also worth mentioning, if we're thinking of the Canadian banks, and we've got you know, two Canadian represented uh, syndicate desks up here, there hasn't been an enormous funding need from the Canadian banks overall. We had a period in 2014, 15, 16, where those Canadian banks were very big borrowers across every asset class. This hasn't been that need over the last 12 to 18 months as well. So, Do you see that changing? Uh, well, I, I, it's probably you know, a question for the funding teams who, who may be represented on other panels. It, it doesn't feel like there's an enormous change for that. And uh, We've had some dollar senior unsecured supply over the last week or two from BMO and Scotiabank. Very well-timed, terrific transactions. Uh, but perhaps you know, when we have the bail-in regime coming in September, covered bonds being outside of scope, it remains to be seen how the new bail inable securities trade and price, but if there's a big differential there, covered bonds have the ability of, of not being bailed in, that might be a feature that's favorable for, for Bob's portfolios, that might see an added incentive to go down the covered route. So the thing I'll add there though, because we've had these conversations and I, some in the room, I, this may echo conversations I've had in other jurisdictions, but the argument we make is that it can't, if it's just purely arbitrage on, on rate or spread, right, it creates an inefficiency. But if you think of the program as deepest, um, you know, one of the deepest credit markets in the world, deepest securitized markets in the world, lots of investors, you can actually access capital in many different environments. Regular issuance promotes that, right? And so we've, we've made this argument in the past that says you have to think about the long-term plan for, for funding and, and accessing U.S. dollar demand seems to be a desire at different points in time in different environments. It gets much more challenging both from an investor perspective and an issuer perspective if you don't have issuance, if you don't have a curve that you can look to, if you don't have dealers that provide liquidity on a regular basis. I think that's, that's that we're trying to create healthier markets, right? So if we're making this the pitch for U.S. dollar covered bonds, I think that's the way to do it, right, is to like create a program and then maintain that integrity of that program. I think that would be a very important sign to the market that you know, investors then look, they'll have something to look at, and dealers will have something to work on. I think that's part of the challenge here is what's the cost of that? Like, what's that worth is the question I think the basis points don't fully address when you just look at the secure to unsecured ratio. 
Anthony, what's the best way to reinvigorate the US dollar uh, investor base in terms of just getting back who are identifying who those investors are and, and bringing them out again, having been sort of that market being absent for so long? I think to, to Bob's point, it will be supply is going to drive liquidity in both the secondary market. It's going to drive interest around the product. Bear in mind that these tend to be investors who um, will typically have a higher than average bite size in terms of the, the, uh, the size of order that they will want to leave on these transactions, which means that if you can only buy a modest piece in the secondary market, it's really not particularly compelling. Uh, whereas the opportunity to put sizable cash to work in, in the primary market really does, I think, invigorate um, uh, interest and, and appetite around the space. I think there's a lot of work that's already being done to identify potential issue, uh, investors of uh, US dollar covered product. I think that's an ongoing thing with the international banks and the bank treasury buyers who generally have multi-currency products um, and have uh, um, uh, a very regular dialogue, I think, with the majority of the larger covered bond bank issuers uh, and reflect that was certainly something that, that, that we do within my institution. And I think that there are a number of other institutions that do a similar, uh, a similar thing. I think that gives in issuers more confidence around the transaction. Um, I think that there are some pockets of the distribution around this product which um, are maybe more challenging to give folk confidence around that. If I think about um, central banks that like to purchase this type of securities, they're generally much more reluctant to engage at the kind of early uh, uh, process in advance of a transaction around what their potential appetite might be and the like. So that's more challenging and involves a little bit more of a leap of faith. And as the, the time goes on and, and the, the, the limited issuance and therefore the more challenging ability to predict what the outcomes of a transaction are going to look like, you see that as being a little bit more, uh, uh, more challenging. But I think, you know, I think about the, the European base in particular of, of issuers, I think that issuers continue to do a very good job of devoting extensive marketing uh, efforts to uh, particularly the, the US European market. issuers. Yeah, I think that they still invest a lot of time and effort and energy into that process. And I do think that whilst um, uh, that's been generally focused around uh, senior or subordinated issuers, I think there's an increasing recognition that a uh, um, covered marketing strategy needs to be a part of that as well. Um, Ultimately, though, I think that many of the, the um, uh, covered bonds that will be printed within the US dollar market will still see a significant portion of their distribution into the non-US market. Uh, and that, I think, will continue to be a theme uh, and is a theme even within uh, US dollar issuance for international issuers as, mm. a, as a whole, generally, in whichever asset class it is. There's plenty of demand for, for US dollar product out of Asia, out of uh, uh, Europe, and I think that's going to continue. Alex, I mean, when, when you look at the, the investor base for, you know, sterling deals, for, for euro deals, uh, cover bonds, the investor base is, is pretty identifiable, but it seems to me, it feels to me like the US investor base for cover bonds is a little bit more slippery. Um, you know, like you said, Anthony, it's also spread around the globe. You've got Asian central mm -hmm. banks, you've got some European guys in there, and then you've got the real prize which everybody's trying to go for, which is the, the proper US investors like Bob. So, but identifying more people like Vanguard, I mean, how, how do you go about that? How do you, how do you grow and grow that pool of buyers and find them? Uh, yeah, so there's a few points in there. Um, look, definitely the, the US dollar covered bond buyer base is pretty broad. Uh, it doesn't benefit from the European market, which has decades, if not, centuries of covered bond history. There is the structured note component, there's the offshore bank treasury component, there's an in official institution component who may have restrictions around senior unsecured, they may be restricted to AAA assets. Uh, I actually view it as relatively identifiable. Maybe I'm in a fortunate position of sitting on a syndicate desk where we are distributing these bonds. Uh, we have conversations with borrowers where we do give a fair amount of comfort around what that order book is gonna look like. Uh, it, it's probably a little bit different to what a European or sterling covered bond will look like. The regulatory environment's a little bit different. Bank treasuries are an important component, but they don't have the same regulatory benefits as you might have in a euro or sterling covered bond. So you won't have a lot of US domestic bank treasury distribution. I think that's, that's a given. But you do have a lot of that offshore, and you do have investors such as Bob and others like him who might look at it from a relative value compared to other forms of ABS, might look at it as a relative value versus senior unsecured. It is a pretty broad distribution. Uh, 
Uh, we've had this conversation just earlier as a, as a panel, but also with, with many borrowers. The buyer base to, between senior and, and covered, there is an overlap, but there's still a sufficient difference that it adds a diversification value to going down the covered route. So like a bit of a long-winded answer, perhaps, of what does the, the investor base look like? There's a number of different components to it, but you know, perhaps that's one of the question marks over the, the product, but to my mind, that's also one of the, the features and the benefits of the product. I mean, it's a different buyer base, and the buyer base has a different approach to investing in covered bonds. Very different, I think, the US investor approach to the way that they look at covered bonds in Europe, where there is a dedicated pool of covered bond buyers, and there tends to be a kind of a top-down approach where they're looking at the sovereign, the legal framework, you know, the issuer, and then they finally get to the pool. Can you tell me a little bit about your approach to looking and investing in covered bonds? Yeah, I mean, I think we, given, given the structured background, right, and given where it sits, we decided to look at it the other way first. Now, that's not saying that those other fact, all those factors matter, right? And so um, I, I think you actually have to bring it back to valuation again because everything we're talking about is, you know, I think you mentioned it in your panel yesterday and you said, you know, you listed the three or four things that are unique, so to speak, to covered bonds, right? So you have, you have the, the subordination, you have the, the dual recourse, you have the legislative frameworks, you have the, the bail-in regimes, right? So you have all these protections, right? So um, I sat down and I'm like, okay, well, let me think about the other things I've, I work on that my team works on. And I'm like, okay, well, we have some of those, not all of those. So, but, but in very, in various fashions, right? It's a question I can ask investors out there is like, if you, if you know anything about structured products, you're like, not all triple A's are the same. So one triple A may be enhanced by 25% and another triple A may be enhanced by 5%. And that difference is those other protections, right? And so what I'm basically telling you is that we're doing that trade-off. I also heard in one of the panels yesterday that they, maybe people don't understand it. I think people do understand it. I think people do understand very, very realistically what we're dealing with as far as the risk profile of a covered bond pool, right? The dilemma is, is that in order to get credit for that covered bond pool's volatility, it should trade differently than the unsecured, but it doesn't. So the question is, is the credit buyer actually the buyer that's driving that spread or is it the rate buyer that's actually those two extremes? Let's put the two extremes out there. The rate buyer says, well, I'm just basically buying secured bank risk and I can trade that because it's liquid until I have to actually access the liquidity. Mm -hmm. right? So it's going back to the real valve framework. So now I'm the structured product guy and I'm able to make trade-offs between secured and unsecured and I have credit card portfolios that I can look at that are basically bank balance sheeted credit card portfolios that seem to trade better than the bank's balance sheet because they're secured and they can be set up as a separate volatility. They also have a very deep and robust market for liquidity, right? Um, so when we look at covers, we fit it into that framework and we, we understand that there's a pool component to it because as the, the, the session before indicated, Wamlu explained why you need to think about the pool. Because when, when, when the receivership happened, nobody was talking about anything other than how you're going to fire sale that pool to get back your recovery value. And then you had to figure out whatever that asset value was at that time, right? Um, what, whatever shortfall occurred there, the rest was going to be make, made up as an unsecured claim against the, the, the bank. And I don't know who's traded those products in the past, but it got fairly efficient. Right. So what you're saying is, is that you'd like more of a bottom-up approach in terms of looking at the pool and the structure, and then you come and think about the other things that are... No, but I, yeah, I do think that we, 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 we check the box on, on what that looks like. We check the box on um, what the counterparty risk is to what, what are the issuers, right? And so then we can look at, but we're definitely looking at how the issuers are positioned relative um, to their peers in the market. Then we look at the jurisdiction. That's where the frameworks also come into play, I think, is a combination of jurisdiction and, and, and structural risk, right? And so we're, we're trying to address the whole, kind of the whole package as far as what, what our strengths and weaknesses are. And then I think because, we can, because we've placed it into our structured framework, now we can make those trade-offs better around other asset classes that we might be looking at that also have similar but not exactly the same. And so what I'm trying to say is like, if you think about it that way, now you can position this, this, this type of risk in a spectrum across both, both ends, right? So if credit card ABS trades here, 
and the unsecured trade here, where do coverage fit in that, mm -hmm. in that framework? That's what I'm trying to say. Is like, I think it's not an either or, yeah. because um, it, to, to be perfectly um, honest to, to, to the quality of the asset, it, is a, it has some real benefits, right? Like there's some real structural and the, the whole legislative framework uh, and and, that, and the way that the, the and so that goes to another question on other than some of the you know larger yeah. larger issuing jurisdictions like how do you get to coverage and some of the more off the run exactly we'll yeah. get there on that but that's so so then you'll understand why the answer to that is like it's much harder to do that framework because also the other piece sorry not to be a little bit fragmented right like lo local local housing so so when we look at because we go across you know we try to go across all the major jurisdictions so then what you start looking at is what is the housing markets for those, those, those environments look like? What are the laws for those markets? Those are the things we start worrying about because we want to understand what the volatility of the underlying mortgage, mortgage, loan, mortgage loan population is going to look like too, right? And so um, in many ways, these types of products serve as the GSE equivalents for, for mortgage risk, right? And so in essence, the issuers, because of the master trust type structure, because of the revolving trust structure, are taking on all the optionality but when investors end up owning the pool, guess what they're going to get, right? Now, we don't want to ever own the pool, right? We don't ever want to, we all agree that that's, that's not what we're planning on here, so don't, don't think of me as saying this, was, but, but, right? Like, I get out, like, this was brought up at a panel yesterday about, like, we shouldn't worry about it, but what do credit analysts do? Like, all they do is worry about the downside. So we have to process the downside, right? That's what we're trying to figure out. That's, that's why we do it this way. Okay, so, I mean, it's not rates, it's not credit, it's not ABS. Question for the audience. Question for the audience is, do cover bonds have an identity problem in the U.S. market? That's pretty clear. So, guys, you've got your work cut out for you. <laughs> okay. Um... We're in Canada, you know, there's been a lot of talk of Canadian issuance and, and uh, with the senior non-preferred law uh, coming out, um, that maybe hopes, hopefully it sort of improves the attractiveness uh, of cover bonds for those guys if the spreads are right. Um, but when we go back uh, to 2012, I believe it was, we had names like Credit Suisse, UBS, CFF, HSBC, Barclays, ING, DNB, Nordea, Swedbank, Sparbank, Credit Agricole, CMCIC, they all did dollar cover bond deals. The market was pretty vibrant. Is that ever likely to come back? Now the ECB is sort of walking away a little bit. So I was just reminiscing there. What happened <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I think that, 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 you know, a number of those uh, names that you mentioned have uh, seen their uh, funding requirements change over the course of that um, uh, five, six year period, that everybody has been focused upon uh, fulfilling regulatory requirements, whether it's building core tier one, whether it's building their uh, MREL uh, capabilities, et cetera, and therefore covered bonds, I think, haven't been as much of a focus. I would say generally wholesale funding programs for uh, international bank institutions have had a tendency to be reduced somewhat over the course of that period as well, rather than getting larger, which means the requirement of incremental capacity uh, probably hasn't been there. The ECB uh, involvement in the euro market has clearly been very beneficial to uh, euro-based funders, or more natural euro-based funders. Um, I'm still optimistic, you know, perhaps uh, uh, foolishly so, but I'm still optimistic that we will see a number of international issuers look to target US dollar markets. I think those uh, uh, issuers will reflect as to what the most appropriate um, uh, format is for them, whether that relative to the Reg S versus 144A debate. Um, but I think that, that you know, it will be something that, that offers an attractive option for, for, for many of those sort of names that, that you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's interesting to look at the distinction, uh, if, if you take it slightly more globally, to think about within, say, the emerging market sphere, and I know there was the, the panel discussions yesterday around do emerging markets, geographies, really, or issuers from those geographies, really get the benefit of the, uh, of the covered bond um, uh, issuance relative to senior unsecured. And I think that European folks definitely do. I think it is debatable in the emerging markets as to whether that, that is something that, that the investor base there really values. But I think 
many of those European issuers that, that you mentioned there definitely do still get that incremental benefit. And as we hopefully continue to uh, uh, be in a, a, a normalized banking market and a normalized wholesale funding market, um, having you know, put a, a lot of water under the bridge behind us, it feels as though focus around that you know, basis point saving that one will be able to achieve there is, is likely to continue. And I think therefore, um, uh, the option of going to the US market, which you're absolutely right, Bob. It's the deepest market in every other asset class in the world. So um, it's a peculiarity of the covered bond market that, that mm. it's not got the same status within that, that landscape. But I think that will develop and I think that, that you know, we'll see many of those names kind of back in the market in some shape or form over the course of, uh, of the next couple of years. Alex, any thoughts to add to that in terms of your hopes and aspirations for European issuers coming back? back to the US market? Yeah, I think the European landscape was very different in 2012 to what it is now. I mean, the banks had to rely on any avenue that they could to fund in, in many ways. It's a very different world now. They benefit from a much better landscape in, in Europe, just broadly speaking, not to mention quantitative easing and the purchasing of covered bonds. So perhaps we don't get those names coming back in the same way we did at that time, but that might be a good thing. But we, you mentioned the emerging market names, and it doesn't have to be emerging market, but the Singaporean names, for example, the names that look at the US dollar covered bond market. Uh, we see a lot of uh, particularly German names look at the potentially more the reg S market, but there's a lot of natural needs for dollars. Uh, now, let's not forget that the dollar is still the world's, in a sense, conventional currency. Uh, it doesn't have to be a US bank. It doesn't have to be a North American bank. There's still a lot of natural dollar needs that makes the dollar covered bond market relatively attractive for, for those names. So perhaps not those exact names that we did see in 2012. Uh, I'd be pleasantly surprised if a lot of those came back, honestly speaking. But there are other names that, that should be able to fill in some of the gaps. Um, so cover bonds in dollars from European issuers, and there's you know, a whole range of different sort of uh, jurisdictions there. You know, you've got the UK, you've got the Eurozone core periphery. Obviously, there's been no dollar issuance from the periphery, but um, maybe one day they will, who knows. Uh, you've got Canadians, Australians, Koreans, Singaporeans. Uh, how do you differentiate between the, the global jurisdictions for, for, I mean, were that markets, were those markets to come back again? How would you uh, differentiate between? I mean, I think the need there is to, un once again, to go back to the framework um, that I've sort of laid out, right? If we can't answer the questions on some of the underlying asset protections and strengths, it, it, you know, it, it, in essence, you can extrapolate that view that that's the risk to the bank if you really want to, you know, take it away from a structured space. But it's the same concept as whatever is going on with the underlying volatility of the asset base is, is the volatility that's going to translate over to the covered bond. So if, if I'm doing this as a total return trade, so to speak, right, that's how I have to think about it is that if the banking sector is at risk and there's potentially a ratio for what the secure to unsecured should trade at, I have to understand that volatility. So we have mm -hmm. to understand the asset value. We have to understand the, the, the local market dynamics as far as mortgage finance or whatever the receivable is. And we have to understand how the issuers are positioned, are these, you know, how strongly rated are these banking entities in relation to that, that, that sovereign. And then what's the quality of the sovereign? So as the sovereign rate, so in essence, if you have built it as a matrix and you had a sovereign rating, you know, grid with the bank ratings, with the covered bonds, we could, you know, I think that's the way the rating agencies actually do their scoring and their analysis also, right, is that they, they basically try to, try to give you that opinion as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the same, same methodology that, that we try to think about. So the weaker, the weaker or the less clarity we have on an understanding of those risks, right, because we're so far removed from them to begin with, the less likely we are gonna be to, to pay up for that risk. I mean, primary activity, visibility, regular issuance would, would clearly be the first thing, right? You can't even start analyzing or pretending to look at a transaction if it doesn't exist. So what would your message be to issuers in terms of sort of maintaining visibility, you know, in terms of building out their curves and getting some pricing points out in, there? In, in all, you mean in all markets, not yeah, just those yeah, esoteric, Yeah, all right? markets. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think clearly I would be a <laughs> fan of just regular issuance that you know, is, is sort of immune to, to kind of the, um, 
best, I mean, I don't want to say it this way, but like best execution doesn't necessarily, that's, that's a relative term, right? Like, You're not going to hear the two syndicate guys disagreeing with the concept of more <laughs> issuances. Than no, this. right, exactly. We're on the same page here, right? <laughs> but you don't really care whether it's in dollars or euros or, right? Like you're still, you're still bringing the bonds to market. I think from a, if we want to focus this, this panel on the USD part of it, right, what we would say is that, right, um, um, it, it's, it's, it creates a tension when, when investors have to look at the liquidity that they're provided in the secondary markets over time and then have to then go in into a new issue and say, what's, what's the new issue? Then you have to say, what's the new issue concession have to be to get compensated for that, that liquidity, right? And so I think that's where the challenge lies. And you made an interesting point. You're like, wow, the coverage were actually trading behind unsecured for a, period, a little period of time. Um, that was not lost on us. <laughs> It was a good deal for you guys. That was, that was not lost on us, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so what I'm saying is like, there are active investors in these markets that kind of understand it. The reason we understood not just that relationship, but there's also this secured, uh, secured to secured relationship. Mm -hmm. I will bring up one other point that is retrading a question, but the other thing that we, you guys mentioned was 144A Reg S and we never mentioned registered, right? <laughs> and so um, you're, you're comparing a product in essence, you are comparing products inaccurately, right? Because there is a, there should be a liquidity premium for 144A in the U.S. registered versus 144A market, right? And I'm like, that's another problem with the product is that, right? It has to compete against other 144As. And I think if you if you put it into that light, right? Then then there are times when that's worth nothing, and then there's times that it's worth a lot. And I think longer, as you think, you know, Vanguard and and my views have a, have have the benefit of being able to have a long horizon because of the nature of the way you know, we think about risk and manage our portfolios and kind of our, our, our place, right? But you see that over time. So we try to process that every day in our, in our evaluation framework. I've it's, had the benefit of being involved in a number of, of SEC driven, uh, SEC registered dollar uh, transactions. I mean, there's a meaningful difference in terms of the distribution that one could achieve that you get the, 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 the small uh, US state buyers and the like, right. you get new pockets of cash even within the same uh, headline uh, fund management institution that you've all heard of, you, you have more multiple portfolios that are able to participate in a transaction in the life. I would say though that I think the, the regulatory, I guess it ties into to comments around liquidity and, uh, and what puts people off issuing, the regulatory environment in terms of the disclosure that's required and the like for SEC relative to uh, 144A, even for issuers who perhaps issue CD unsecured in uh, SEC format um, uh, you know, is something that, that clearly nobody is, is, is that excited about moving down the path of providing the, the necessary disclosures and the like that are required. So um, I, I think it's, it's, it's not easy for someone to do, uh, uh, to contemplate that an SEC registered format. Uh, so would you, I mean, what would you say Reg AB has done for SEC registered type trades? Uh, I'd say it's made it more challenging. That was such a bait question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there's lots of hopes for issuance uh, here. I mean, it has to grow, really, because it's, it's come from a, a virtually zero position. Um, let's see what the audience thinks. Uh, so the question is, how much dollar issuance will we see this year? Um, hopefully, it'll come up soon. Uh, and in the meantime, we'll, we'll move over to talk about liquidity. Um, so we've got uh, liquidity, given the eligibility of Fanbrief and Canadian Senior for Fed repo, what chance is there that the Fed of accepting collateral, do you think? Uh, Alex? Uh, yes, yeah, sadly, I, I, I don't think there is an enormous chance of that happening. I think that the Basel framework and that the Fed's equivalent came out a few years ago around HQLA and, and, and similarly that was, you know, dollar covered bonds were not given the most favorable treatment in the US compared to what they get overseas. Uh, so I think that's been made pretty clear. I, I don't think that that is likely in the in near term, sadly, uh, but I don't think that that has ever been, at least from our perspective, it's not been something that on the basis of which we market the dollar covered bond. So. I don't think it's likely to happen. I don't think it's been expected. So I don't really view that as holding back the market either. Uh, the market is functioning in, in a different way without the enormous investment from the bank treasury portfolios that you might get in other products that are more regulatory driven. Uh, I think that this is probably an asset class that uh, 
stands on its own two feet based on relative value and based on the quality of the asset itself rather than any um, you know, repo considerations. I mean, in, in Europe, it is obviously a, a very much a driven, regulatory driven product. Um, Bob, what's your view on, on, on the need for having regulations such as maybe LCR, eligibility uh, for cover bonds? I mean, do you think it needs it? Or? I, I really let the dealer and the investment <laughs> banks handle these questions because it's not, I mean, it's um, cl clearly that, that would indicate a, um, an ability to provide more balance sheet liquidity, right? And so that's, that's, that's part of the challenge. Um, but I think that these guys are in the best position to tell you the real, the, real, the real impact of you, how much more liquidity they would actually provide if they didn't have some of these constraints. If you think about um, uh, the, the Fed, the Fed really only makes a, a, a US regulators really only make adjustments that they're being attentively lobbied for from US banks. It doesn't feel as though the US banks are going to be making those lobbying requests anytime soon because they're blessed by having a number of other GSC. avenues yeah. to pursue in terms of an efficient mortgage market within the, within the US. So um, in the absence of that, I, I do completely agree with, with Alex's view that, that that's not going to be something that's going to change in the near term. Um, you know, what might um, you know, trigger a bit more secondary liquidity? Um, I think if there was more, uh, uh, more issuance, you would find a bit more focus within institutions. There'd be more money in the pot to pay for traders, right? If, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you think of it as a pretty basic... Uh, uh, basic level, uh, there'd be more product, more liquid instruments that we all would be able to um, uh, uh, to make um, uh, make active markets in, and I think that that, that would help. Um, I would also say that I think that to your point around um, uh, where does it fit on the sort of rates, credit spectrum, and the like, um, uh, uh, different institutions I think treat it in a different fashion. In some places it sits on the credit desk, in some places it's probably going to sit on the rates desk. Um, they can either be viewed as the, the uh, low beta end or the high beta end of a particular stick, whether you're an SSA dollar trader or a, a, a senior unsecured dollar trader, and you covered bonds in a different fashion from your, uh, from your portfolio as a consequence. And I think if there was a little more regula regularity of um, the bucket that they sat in across the street, that would probably help a little bit as well in terms of having a more identifiable sector in the same way that they are in Europe. Right? In, in Europe, most folks would generally have at, at least a dedicated covered bond trader uh, who trades a space, they might trade multi-currency, they might trade you know, euros and sterling, you might have separate uh, uh, traders for both. Um, uh, but I think that that lack of specialism within the US market doesn't help for liquidity. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I feel for, for Bob and the, the, you know, the liquidity that one sees in the market is, is really very limited at times. Can you talk about the liquidity that you see in dollar cover bonds when there were some dollar cover bonds? Relative well, I mean, to, there's still to the actually other asset There is actually dollar, dollar. They do trade in the secondary, right? So, like, we, we know that um, because we have traded them in the secondary. Um, it's an interesting question about liquidity because um, once I, 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 we, as we discussed this in our prep, right, like, it's all relative. So, we've got these AAA assets that issue, you know, multiple billions at a time or, or a billion at a time. Investors like us may buy larger pieces of those those risks and then the expectation and the thinking that we have behind that is how are we going to trade those larger pieces, right? So the um, question is, is it what, what kind of liquidity can you get in coverage relative to other asset classes? So say senior, for example. Yeah, so senior is interesting. A, senior is a much bigger market, but it's also um, you know fragmented, and therefore the float gets a lot bigger that you have to process as a bank, right? And so, so the balance sheets get kind of full with seniors too. So... Um, I think what's interesting about coverage is that if you have to trade large block and when large block does trade, it can reprice the market, right? And that's the risk in covered bonds in some ways about liquidity because the streets won't, the street won't necessarily balance mm -hmm. as aggressively as they would other products, right? Given all the factors that we've cited. Um, so well, part of the problem I think is like a lot of the desks are European oriented, right? A lot of the desks don't necessarily think of focus US dollar coverage. So your point is spot on there, right? Like I think that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, I think the other challenge is that it's a concentrated market in the buyer base, right? Even though there's a lot of USD buyers, when you start looking at the order book and sort of figuring out the top 10 versus the, the rest, right? I think it is concentrated in some ways as to the, the, the holders of most USD covered. So, so that's, I think, the, the challenge of liquidity. It's, it's, it's good, but we have to definitely factor that in. Mm. I mean, it's good at when you, well, it's good at times. Then. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not really good that good It's sometimes. not really that good. So it's like, um, it, it, 
It's um, but which is it's, more it's important? Not, it's not like a it's not like a rate product. That's that's okay. Let's put it that way. Maybe I'll be a voice of a little bit a little bit of optimism. Uh, I view the bid side liquidity as as pretty decent. It's not immune to volatility in times of stress. The offer side liquidity, I I agree, is very challenging. It's a buyer base where the investors are very much buy and hold. Uh, the free float in that sense is smaller, even if the notional size of a covered bond might be larger than a senior unsecured bond. The, as you say, the, the buyer base is a little bit lumpier. So there's not the same frequency of trading. It's, there's not a lot of inventory around. And to your point that the market can be repriced, it takes something like a catalyst, maybe a period of volatility, maybe one motivated investor. And as soon as we see that sort of environment appear, we find it's relatively straightforward to recycle those bonds. Sure, there's, there can, can be a spread impact, but the notionals that we, go, we see go through on a single ticket basis are multiples on a covered bond compared to a senior unsecured bond. It just might be a week or so between one of those events happening. So I think that the liquidity is definitely constrained on the offer side for some perhaps structural reasons around the market, which are actually some of the benefits of the market, long-term buy and hold investor base. Uh, and it's just, you know, can we offer those bonds without having them? It's extremely challenging to do so. So that makes the offer side constrained. And if the market is functioning in a you know, relatively stable market, our bid side should be relatively aggressive. And we should be able to put a bid on a bigger block of covered bonds than we would do for a senior unsecured bond. How does that sort of liquidity that you get in covered bonds in dollars uh, sort of marry up relative to the buyer base for you know other triple A rates type products. I mean, is that is that a problematic for syndicate desk to be targeting something which is, I suppose, fundamentally less less uh, liquid? Uh, there's always problems for syndicate desks and we'll always find them wherever we, wherever we can. I guess the, uh, the challenge around liquidity is that um, when you're comparing Genuine rates product versus covered bonds. I think I think nobody really makes that comparison anymore. Like we, we don't try to sell a dollar covered on the basis of this is a pickup versus treasury, and this is a pickup versus an agency piece of paper. Um, I think that 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 time has gone. You do still see that sort of argument being made in the European markets. If one says, look at the pickup that you're getting relative to a sovereign bond, look at particularly in some of the peripheral jurisdictions and the like. So the, the different currency markets take a different approach to it. I think in terms of trying to position appropriately that level of, uh, mm. of liquidity. And I think in covenants, as you've heard, more of the arguments are made versus uh, senior unsecured than they are relative to, um, uh, relative to genuine rates product. And I think that's unlikely to, to adjust. You know, no, nobody's really expecting dollar coverage to, um, uh, to be on, on the, the rates product proxy radar. I think also some of that is to do with the regulatory treatment as well. If you yeah. are a high quality liquid asset portfolio as a Example, um, I mean, you, you really ap appropriately get a very different liquidity treatment for uh, those those genuinely liquid rates products relative to something like covered bonds, and that does apply in, in both Europe as well as uh, uh, as well as the US. I mean, the big the big elephant in the room is, or are the GSEs really? And if if it wasn't for them, then maybe there would be scope for, or there would be a need for US issuers to to fund their mortgage books with, with covered bonds. Um, but for the moment, it doesn't look like we're gonna get much in the way of GSE reform. So it's a question for the audience. Uh, is the US government serious about GSE reform? Okay, so yeah, we can take it that it's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the current status quo is, is probably likely to remain for, for quite a, a while yet, with the market being occupied largely by foreign issuers. I don't mean, I don't, I'll kind of answer this question a little bit. I don't, I don't see why, um, I mean, GSE reform does not mean GSE going away, right? GSE reform means shrinking the GSE's footprint. And the other, the other, the other area of focus that I've spent a lot of my time on is private label securitization, the return of private which is even more fun than the return of US dollar covered bonds if you want to do academic exercises that go nowhere, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, there's a credible case for what private label securitization should look like in the, the new world, right? 
Um, but the challenge is, is that that because of the GSC footprint, right? That so so what I'm saying is like first will be GSC reform, which we've already established may take a while. Then will come private label securitization. Then will come covered bonds because I think the U.S. market has become very efficient at pricing the optionality of mortgages. Mm. And so from an issuer's perspective, it makes a lot of sense to put that into the private market in a more direct transfer of risk, whether it's prepayment risk or credit risk, right? And so I think that's why it works for the U.S. market because we've, we've figured, we, you know, we've gotten it wrong a few times, but like, I think that's what we prefer to do because we have the ability to process that um, cost. Mm. I mean, so. it's, it's a great point from Bob. I think that perhaps one of the, the weaknesses perhaps of the dollar covered bond market historically speaking has been we've tried to look at it as a rates product or we've, we've tried to look at it as a comparison versus the, MB, sorry, the GSEs or, or sovereigns in other jurisdictions. You know, maybe it's a, it's a challenge but also an opportunity to look at it versus structured credit versus consumer ABS. There's a long running tradition in the US of MBS investment. You know, there is a, a deep understanding from the investor base of mortgage collateralization. You know, I think that it's quite telling, Bob, that we have one of the big investors up here looking at it from a structured bond perspective or a structured credit perspective rather than what you might have in other jurisdictions is looking at it versus a rates perspective or a regulatory HQLA motivated perspective. So you know, in many ways, I think it's, a, it's an actually a big opportunity for the US that you can have a, a very knowledgeable investor base, deeply experienced in mortgage collateralization, looking at this sort of product, but their, their perspective has just been a little bit different, which is pure RMBS or MBS or even consumer ABS. Do you ever hear investors complain about transparency, poor transparency in covered bonds? Uh, we, we haven't had a lot of complaints, honestly, on, on that point. There is uh, a reasonable level of disclosure. I know that there is, uh, at least from the TD Bank perspective, you go on the Investor Relations website, quite a detailed monthly report provided. Uh, I do believe that it's probably provided by nearly every issuer in the dollar-covered bond market. So, you know, I'm sure Bob will, will have more detailed views, but from our perspective, I haven't heard a lot of complaints on that topic, no. Okay, so Bob, I mean, we talk about investor protection. We've got exclusion from bail-in and legal frameworks, dual recourse, special administrator, blah, 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 over collateralization. Um, why is it important not to mix those conversations with other forms of investor protection, such as, i.e., meaningfully, the what's in the pool? Um, I think the reason, so, so Alex's point on, this is last point, right, is, is important in my mind because um, I think there is an opportunity where investors understand the risk. And what I've been trying to say in this presentation and in all the conversations I have with issuers about various products is that we, we, we're giving credit. You know, one of the questions was people don't understand coverage. I'm like, no, we understand coverage. We, we're, we're giving credit wherever we can and want for what we think is. But, but we, investors, I think, generally in this space separate those risks, like it's not just one leg of a stool, like there's multiple legs of the stool. And to keep it simple, right, there's transparency, governance, and, and alignment, right? And so let's think about covered bonds in that framework, right? They hit a few, of, they hit all of them actually, but they hit them in varying degrees, right? And one is, one part of the stool may be stronger than one leg may be stronger than the other. So, but investors wanna build the strongest pillar that they can for their investment, right? Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't overlap them in, in the conversation because we're still striving to try to maximize all of those. So in transparency terms, right, what we're noticing because Reg AB2 is one example where, um, you know, we've, we've increased levels of disclosure in certain asset classes. Certain asset classes always have had some level of disclosure, but what, what's happening is that as more transparency is coming into the markets in certain asset classes, A, it's highlighting certain discrepancies in pool quality, but it's also now, um, building a framework that investors are starting to give credit for that disclosure, right? And so what it does do is creates healthier and more stable markets, which translates into funding costs. Um, and what, what investors are willing to do, it seems, is to process that information. So even to your point, you have provided the reports, but what, what, what the concept of transparency and pool level disclosure and whatever form, right? Certain types of assets go to loan level, certain types of assets we've argued and as industry standards have gone to more group data where the pools are dynamic and revolving, right? Meaning you, you can do it in a way that organizes data so that, that it's not it's not providing, you know, not having to provide 300 to a million line items at a given time, right? That's that's the risk. Um, but, but what's really needed is a mechanism to standardize 
that disclosure as, as a way to be able to then put it into third party or in internally organized systems to actually um, uh, process data efficiently. Now, we'll use the Reg AB2 example to go off on a tangent a little bit, but like for private label securities that are mortgages that are deemed to be problematic, there's like 200 plus fields that were required, right? For credit card ABS and auto ABS, there was 20, right? Like, so I think what we're trying to rationalize is for the level of risk, how much disclosure is needed, right? Mm -hmm. So just as an example, as a kind of range. So, so I think that's what we have to come up to is like, what's the right standard? And can you create it in a way that's, autom that, that's, that's consistent across, you know, in coverage it has to be multiple jurisdictions, um, multiple regulators, right? And it, can it be processed in a way that can be automated so that it, 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 it's, um, it can be used, right? And one of the things about the reports that, 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 that you're providing is that they're sort of one layer. What investors are really looking for is cross-sectional layers. And honestly, what I was, when we were talking in this conversation, what investors are looking for is the current state of that pool. They don't know when the pool is going to have to stop revolving, but they want to know that when it does stop revolving, that, it's, that they have the information they need to process what it looks like to the WAMU example, right? Nobody's anticipating that event, but the, 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 the hurdle is to be able to have the information you need at that time so that you can prevent the asset from going to 50 cents on the dollar as a, you know, like you can do the work that, that's the whole point of this is that you're not just tied then to mismatches in information, that you actually, the, the market can actually look into the, to that asset level disclosure mm -hmm. and stabilize the volatility of the asset through different environments, right? That's, that's, that's sort of the soapbox on, on why transparency matters. And I think for coverage, I think we're at a point in some of these, these asset classes where we can actually probably do something more to standardize and automate the delivery of that information. Okay, so we've got a few minutes left now coming to the end of the panel session and just really wanted to turn, turn it over to the audience. You know, we've discussed uh, liquidity, GSC reform a little bit, transparency, you know, we've discussed about spreads, relative value. Does anybody in the audience have any, any questions for our panelists today? No questions, one question. Hi, Greg McDonald from uh, TD Securities. Do we see uh, any force transition or movement from the senior space over to the cover bond space post the implementation date of bail-in in Canada from investors? Um, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, I think that there could be some. Uh, if I think about uh, investors that, that uh, I've met recently, uh, I can think of a couple of examples where folks have said, um, I uh, am a current investor in Canadian senior unsecured. Uh, my investment mandate going forward means that, that I actually can't transition with you to the new um, uh, available um, uh, senior debt. Um, but you know, that's a very unusual example, I think. I think the vast majority, if you think about available senior debt and what a standardized international asset class that has become, whether it's Holco, whether it's uh, senior non-preferred, the majority of folks have established themselves in their investment mandate very quickly to encompass the, the, the whole of that. Um, I think it's unlikely as a consequence that you'll see big shift um, uh, out of uh, bailable senior into, uh, into covers. It'll be a bit spread dependent as well though, right? I mean, none of us know quite yet where the Canadian bail and senior unsecured debt will, uh, will price. Um, but the, the, the delta between covers and, and, and that debt probably you know, does, will have some impact around any movement that we see, but I wouldn't expect there to be any significant movement there. Maybe I'll just make one point. It's going to be interesting how it affects the Canadian banks. The Canadians don't really have an alternative to bail inable senior, whereas other jurisdictions, you have NPS, PS, you have Holdco, Opco. The Canadians will be one of the few which don't have an alternative apart from structured issuance, covered bonds, being part of that, or under 400-day securities, which... Sure, it's, it's nice to have, but it doesn't help your term funding. So if it affects anyone, maybe the Canadians, but I would agree with Anthony that investors are very used to the concept of bail inable. They have to be now. Any other questions? Thanks, Bill. Uh, Rob Collins from Nationwide in the UK. Pop, um, very clear your, your direction around uh, uh, disclosure, et cetera, and we've had these conversations a lot in the past. Um, I think the one thing that's perhaps missing from the discussion, I'd be curious as to how you and your credit guys look at 
this, is how you look at the relative strength of the underlying institution, given the environment we're all in now, you know, huge capital ratios and the such like, and how that may or may not inform your decision about the sort of distance to the likelihood of you ending up owning the asset pool, which as you quite clearly state you don't want to do, and whether you give any actual credit around the underlying strength of the issuing institution. Um, it, clearly it factors in to um, the investment thesis, but I don't think that you can overlap um, forgoing disclosure for strength of institution in the sense of um, being pure to, 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 the, to the point that you want to have all of those factors, right? So, so in some ways, you want standard disclosure across the industry, right? Like in, in essence, so that you can compare pools. If you're doing it in a structured framework, you want to be able to compare pools for pool quality across all industries. Then you want to make a trade-off on, on, um, on strength of institution. So in essence, the process should, w in our framework, should work that if one pool looks stronger or weaker than another pool, that should be a plus or minus on, 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 on what credit you give to the, to, to the transaction. Then you look at the institution, you say, is that, is that a good or bad institution? You know, what's the relative strength? So it's a plus or minus on that. And then you look at the, um, the structure of the transaction, and that's a plus or minus, or the, you know, the, the framework around the, the, the governance, and if it's a plus or minus on that. Now you've basically come together and said, if they all offset, then the spread's the same. If one is better than the other on one of those, then either one issuer is better or weaker. That's how you try to differentiate issuers. So what I'm trying to say is separate them, come up with independent views across all those tenants and then aggregate that into a view on the overall credit risk of a transaction and one institution or one, one shelf or however you want to call it would, would, would then hopefully trade better or worse than another based on those views. If the market did that efficiently every day, right, then we would be able to differentiate on the same. But since I know they don't, that that's the way we do it, we should be able to then pick up on value and opportunity based on that. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? So that uh, brings our panel to an end. Thank you very much. Thanks.